Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Nathan Nugro, and I'm the CEO of the Colorado Springs Philharmonic. And my guest today is our featured performer on this uh, this terrific bash, annual bash that we have at the Pikes Peak Center. Uh, he is Aaron Deal. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Nathan, it's a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to performing in Colorado Springs on the 31st. Yeah, it's... It, we're so glad you said yes. Uh, this has been a long-standing tradition for us, and uh, and this is I don't know I don't know that we've had anyone of uh, of your your background and, and caliber uh, on stage on New Year's Eve before. It's oh. it's it's going to be it's going to be a real delight for us. Oh, well, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I've been to a few different places in Colorado, but never Colorado Springs. I've been to Aspen, to Vail, to Denver. And there's one other place in Colorado I've been to, and it just escaped my memory. So this is, I can add this to my list. There we go. We'll, we'll, we'll get on the list finally. Uh, but, you know, Aaron, you'll be performing Gershwin's Concerto in F. And, but your, yeah. your career, your career is, is not just in in one genre or another. I mean, you 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 blended jazz and jazz and classical in your in your in your career in a in the most interesting way. Well, you know, it's it's not. I can't say that it's anything new. I mean, one of my mentors is the great uh, Marcus Roberts. Mar Marcus Roberts um, is from Tallahassee, Florida. He uh, got his start to his career playing with like Marsalis um, and uh, his small ensemble and uh i remember when i was a kid you know in studying piano um i'd hear marcus's recordings one was uh gershwin for lovers which is a really uh great uh trio recording but then also he uh, he had recordings um his own small group recordings, but I remember hearing a recording of him playing, I think it was on Sony Classical playing um, playing Gershwin and also James P. Johnson with orchestra. And um, uh, he was someone that I always, that always fascinated me in the sense that, uh, you know, he had this rich tradition of uh, blues and uh, you know, African American folk traditions and um, this whole syncopated tradition, but then uh, at the same time, you know, he's very his approach to to me was always very uh, his approach to a piano, I should say, was always uh, I could tell was a, a lot of it was out of the European tradition as well, and he combined these elements. And uh, I mean, his sound was always very uh, uh, enticing to me. You know, he's such a rich sound and is a rich uh, approach to the instrument. And I would say that, you know, Marcus's influence is, has been strong on me over the years in the sense of, you know, taking um, as much of the piano tradition as possible to inform our own uh, approaches to playing and you know the thing about piano and he would always say this is like you know you basically have 500 years worth of, of keyboard literature and there's just so much that's been written for the keyboard instruments and piano even though it's a relatively new instrument uh, you know give it I'd say give it to about 200 years 250 years something like that. but there's so much literature and, and, and from that literature informs you know us how we can approach playing the piano in a variety of ways, no matter what quote unquote genre you play. So, uh, you know, to me, working in a bit of both worlds, if you w will, it, it, sort of the infrastructures, uh, you know, that's one thing, but then, you know, really ha having to grasp and grapple with, uh, just the gargantuan um, uh, abilities of the instrument, the, you know, the, the instrument, the, 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 the availability, the, the, excuse me, the, uh, uh, the, the, po the available possibilities of what the in instrument can do. 
has always been fascinating and just, you know, trying to bring a little bit or a little bit of that to what I do and, 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 and slowly pick away at, at uh, finding, you know, what, what, what the instrument is capable of doing. I mean, think about some, uh, someone like our Tatum, who I think was probably the greatest virtuoso on the instrument. I mean, at least in recorded history. I mean, lists you could say lists was, you know, he, there are no recordings of him. But you know, you listen to someone like Tatum, and you and you realize, like, oh my gosh, like, you know, it, it's almost limitless the possibilities of the, the instrument, just the, up to the you know, the 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 uh, person executing the music on the instrument, you know, them to, to bring those possibilities to life. So it's a lifelong pursuit. It's, it's a, and you never really master it. So I think that's the great challenge in, in playing, playing the piano, you know, no matter what you're playing, whether it's Beethoven or you know, Thronius Monk. You know, it's, it's always impressed me because pianists, no, no matter what their what their style is, they have to have a certain mindset because when you go on the road, it, you know every, we know that every instrument anywhere has its own idiosyncrasies, and pianists are the only ones who can't can't easily bring their acts with them. Right. Pian well, I think organists have it even more rough because <laughs> those. Many, many of those instruments aren't standardized, so you play it. Yeah. But, but uh, yes, you're right. right. And and what's uh, what's interesting about that is you know, trying to get, you know, try I guess trying to find the uh, the characteristics of the individual instrument and, and figuring out what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and and exploiting those. And, and I think the greatest musicians, uh, the greatest pianists are the ones who it doesn't matter, it didn't matter if they were playing a, a beat up spinet or they were playing a nine foot concert instrument, they still got the character out of the instrument that was appropriate for the music that they, they, they played. I mean, that's it. I remember I had a, uh, recently I had a couple instruments that you know, weren't ideal, but I always think about someone again like Tatum who would intentionally play on bad pianos to see what he could extract out of them. Um, it's it's hard. It's a hard because you know, of course, pressure's on, and you want to sound the best, and you want it to be as easy as as it can be. But I think at the end of the day, it's not necessarily. It's about here. Yeah. When you use this more than you use this, I think there are many more, um, many more avenues that can be taken with with very fascinating results. Was that a breakthrough for you? Because I think that's huh, a very I mean, important point. When you use this more than this, was that a breakthrough for you at a certain point? It's I, I, I I'm still working on it. I'm still working. Of course, you want to you know. You figure out what you want here, and then you figure out well, what's technically necessary in order to execute that. But the more you tr one trusts their ears and um, you know are instantly able to um, react physically to what they're hearing, yeah. I think that is, and in, and of course, in in you know jazz music, uh, improvised music of all types that's really what you have to do you know it's it's composition in real time you know when we talk about quote unquote improvisation I mean, that's it's just you know, you're just doing instantaneous doing it instantaneously so yeah and my and personally my ears aren't the best i really i just still have to to work on that and, and some colleagues of mine who have just incredible ears and can hear anything i mean not just like perfect pitch but they're able to make associations and they understand the harmonic series so well, and just, you know, but for me, um, that was something that I always struggled with and like trusting more and, and, 
and what I'm actually hearing and, and chasing that sound. Just keep chasing that sound until you, especially in the practice room, you say like, ah, I'm hearing this and just keep working with it until you get it just right. Well, Im imagine that we have some audience members coming to this performance who are not familiar with Gershwin's concerto in half. Yeah, the, you know, us, talking, give, give us a taste of what we're, what they can expect. I mean, you know, this was the, the first piece, proper concerto that Gershwin wrote. The mm -hmm. Rhapsody in Blue, I was just talking to a colleague, just a colleague this, this afternoon about Rhapsody in Blue because you know, it's interesting that this piece has become like sort of a masterpiece, if you will, in the canon. But in my estimation, it's not really that great of a piece. And 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 I don't think Gershwin would have, if he were alive, he might have said the same thing. I mean, he he had only five weeks to write it, you know, and he only found out through a uh, an advertisement or a, new, a newspaper article. Um, you know, Paul Whiteman didn't even, you know, tell him directly, like, hey, you're, you know, you've got to write this piece in five weeks or whatever. Yeah, you know, he had to, he had to come up with something very quickly and and even Ferdy Gouffet, he orchestrated it. So the the concerto on F gave Gershwin an opportunity to actually spend some time learning about orchestration. He did the orchestration himself. And, you know, there's there are full three movements there. And um, you know, I think, especially for that time, you're talking the mid twenties, uh, it was a really full formed piece incorporating sort of the structure of the, uh, the, the Western canon with some sensibilities that it, uh, that are um, unique to American folk music, to African American folk music, and there, there are all kinds of arguments that people talk about, honestly, about you know appropriation with Gershwin, and 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 you know that's a conversation that it's that's a long drawn conversation we could have at another time, but you know Gershwin had a deep respect for musicians like James P. Johnson and. and uh, Willie the Lion Smith and Bat Swaller. He knew these people and um, spent some time with them. So I think, you know, Gershwin uh, was very keen on incorporating all of these elements that he understood, that he knew about into this sort of formal structure of the quote unquote piano concerto. Definitely much more of a piano concerto than the Rhapsody ever was, you know. I, you know, I know that's a popular piece now, uh, nowadays, but uh, I mean, a concerto is a much, a much more um, thought out uh, and um, yeah, fully formed work. Yeah. Do you find that, that it uh, allows you to, uh, some opportunities to take liberties with it? Appropriate liberties. I mean, appropriately, I mean, I, you know, it's funny because um, There are there's a condensed in the second movement and I and I typically do um, play my own condensas and um, there are, there are some embellishments that I make but you know nothing I don't think um, too uh, radical if you will um, but I, I do I, I I do improvise on the the cadenza which you know I think is a is something that you know, that uh, is common even in the 18th century. It's not done very much anymore. And prob probably, probably, I would imagine Gersh would have would approve. Huh. I don't know. Maybe you know. Yeah. My, he my, won't, like he won't I, be there on New Year's Eve. Though, he so. he won't be there. You know, he won't be there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I I do enjoy play after playing this work. You know, over the years, I I, I do still quite enjoy it. It's really beautiful themes. Um, the first theme that that comes up in the first movement, um, especially is I feel like it's very rich melodically, and um, then you know the second movement has uh, like a very nice trumpet solo. Um, 
So, yeah. Um, well, Aaron Deal, we are delighted that you're coming to Colorado Springs. Your Colorado Springs debut, brother. It's great. <laughs> oh, thanks so much, Nathan. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be uh, talking to you. And then I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully, hopefully it's not going to be snowing too crazily when I'm there. Yeah, well, we can't promise anything, but I think you'll be okay. Uh, I think gotcha. you'll be okay. I'll give you the final word. Uh, final word? Uh, what is the final word? I'd say, uh, if anything, you know, come out on the 31st. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to playing for all the wonderful people of Colorado Springs and um, celebrating the new year with you all. Aaron Deal, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. You're exceptional. Take care now. You too.